Now a certain man named Simon had previously practised magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. All of them, from the least to the greatest, listened to him eagerly, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they listened eagerly to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. After being baptised, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and great miracles that took place. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. Now after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villagers of the Samaritans. Just a reminder that we will, all of these videos will be on the website, on the YouTube site, so that you, if you miss one, then you'll be able to pick it up there. So for this season, we're looking at the book of Acts. If you've got a couple of hours this afternoon, it's not a long book, and it contains lots of stories that you might be familiar with. It starts off with Jesus. He's died, he's risen from the dead, and he meets with the disciples. He's then taken back up into heaven, but you'll remember the second part of the book of Acts. He leaves the Holy Spirit. So when the disciples meet in the upper room, tongues of flame come and rest on them, and they're enabled to do amazing things, speak in languages that they didn't know. This is crucial. You'll remember last week we said the disciples had travelled with Jesus. They'd heard him say lots of things, and we hear them again and again say, oh no, Lord, I'm sure that's not right. To the point where Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. But at the coming of the Holy Spirit, suddenly it clicks. Like that. Suddenly they realize that all that Jesus has been saying is true. When Jesus says that they have power in the Holy Spirit, they know that they have power in the Holy Spirit. So they start to do what they've seen Jesus doing. Now this is a bit challenging for the people in Jerusalem. Jesus has told them to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. The people in Jerusalem are good Jews and they think they're doing the right thing. But here is this group of people who are able to do miracles. We heard last week that they healed a man at the beautiful gate at the temple. And that's a bit challenging. If you have based your religion, your faith, on the fact that you know what is right and you're waiting for the Messiah, the chosen one of God, to appear. And it transpires that the chosen one of God might have actually appeared already 
And instead of welcoming him, you have persecuted him and even put him to death. Where do you go from there? Are you able to backtrack? Or do you then start to punish those who you think must, therefore, be in the wrong because you can't possibly be in the wrong? Remember, the people in Jerusalem, the temple authorities, uh, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and even the Jews in Judea, where Jerusalem was, felt that they were somehow more holy. They were more righteous than the peoples who surrounded them. Even to the point of not accepting most of the apostles, because they came from Galilee. Galilee wasn't quite as holy or quite as righteous as the people of Judea. It operated like a sort of series of concentric circles. And the further away you got from the temple at Jerusalem and the people of Judea, the less holy and the less righteous you were. Now this is significant because this reading that Adrian's just brought us takes place in Samaria. Samaria was one of the areas that was settled when God took his people, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt and brought them to the promised land. Two of the tribes of, of the Jews, uh, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh, settled in Samaria. But it was a little bit outside of those central circles. And as time went on, they came to be regarded as somehow impure, not as holy, not as righteous. They were right on the edges of the Jewish world. They were Jewish, but somehow they weren't proper Jews. Now, back to the story in Acts. Of course, the temple authorities and the Jews in Judea because they're challenged by what the apostles are doing, they have this choice. What do they do? Do they admit, yes, we made a mistake and we've actually managed to crucify the chosen one of God? Or do we do something else? If you've got your Bible, you'll see at the beginning of that chapter, chapter 8, that day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. You see, what's happening is the church is being created. Now, we often look at the end of chapter 2, verse 42, and we read that the church was, had held all things in common, they met together, uh, they ate together and they prayed together. And we say that is the mark of the church. But the church at the time would not have agreed with that because they were looking back to Jesus. What had Jesus done? That's what we must do as church. And we, 2,000 years further on, also look to what the early church does, which reflected what Jesus done. We've said, haven't we, that Jesus had five priorities when he walked on the earth. People, teaching, team building, prayer, and prophetic challenge. And as we go through the book of Acts, you'll see that the early church reflected exactly that. Because they know, filled with the Spirit of Jesus, that they needed to do exactly what Jesus was doing. That's laying the foundation for church now, in the power of the Holy Spirit. What they had done was continue to preach and teach to the people in Jerusalem. And they built exactly what happens in church sometimes now. They'd built a mega church. Everyone was coming along together. They were living together. It was all very exciting. They were worshipping together. How fantastic. Isn't this wonderful? And then persecution starts. 
and the church is scattered. Disaster. We can't do what we think we should be doing. We can't do what makes us feel comfortable. But for the furthering of the church, this was exactly in line with what God wanted. Wonderful having everyone together, but nobody hears outside of Jerusalem if we're all in one place, all together at the same time. So in this scattering, which we, in our human perception, would view as the worst thing that could possibly happen to this wonderful church, he's enabled the apostles and all the disciples and all those who had met with Jesus and heard him speak to go far and wide, not just in Judea, we hear, but beyond that to Samaria. In actual fact, this is what Jesus had done first. Jesus told a story about a man who was going on his way on a journey where he was set upon by robbers. And they beat him and robbed him and they left him for dead. You'll know the story. And a Levite and a priest, his holy people, passed by on the other side of the road. But it was a man from Samaria, a Samaritan, who stopped and helped him. We even, even adopted the word Samaritan to mean someone who does good things. But actually, he was just a man of Samaria. There's another occasion, there's several actually, when Jesus met someone from Samaria. He'd been teaching and preaching all day. And in the evening, he settled down near a well. And the apostles, his disciples, went off to the village to find some food. And while he was there, a woman came to the well to draw water. And Jesus asked, will you draw water for me? Now, she was a woman of Samaria, a Samaritan woman. And she said, but aren't you Jews too holy for that? You believe that you should worship in the temple. We Samaritans believe that we should worship on a mountain. And Jesus told her, this woman of Samaria, that amazing truth that in time, worship will neither happen on the mountain or in the temple, but it will happen in spirit and in truth. Jesus entrusted that truth to the woman of Samaria. So in actual fact, Jesus was including all of those folks who we might say were right on the fringes of those concentric circles. So when the church, the early church, was scattered, some of them were scattered to exactly the places that Jesus wanted to include in his good news. Perhaps they were shocked, perhaps they were horrified, perhaps they were really anxious. In actual fact, they were absolutely in the will of God. And what did they do finding themselves in this strange place? Well, here we have Philip. The most important thing for Philip to do is to tell everyone about Jesus. So that's what he does. He's gone to Samaria. Samaria is a, a region, but it's also a city. And this is talking about the city. He's gone to the city of Samaria, and he wants to tell people about the hope and the future that there is in Jesus. And here he encounters Simon. What do we think about Simon? Well. Simon is a magician. He's able to do tricks. And so he's become quite an important thing because, you see, society hasn't changed. We still chase after excitement. We still think that people are wonderful if they are different and exciting, charismatic. There's been a story in the news the last couple of weeks about someone who society considered was exciting and new and allowed him a platform. And now it's beginning to emerge that he might actually have been abusive. We don't know about Simon, 
But he came along with this real excitement. He could do magic tricks. And so his society, his... Oh, the magician. <laughs> Societies and cultures are always the same. We're always looking for hope and a future and something exciting to draw us out of the dull and frankly quite, frankly, quite anxiety-inducing lives that we live. There's no change from then until now. And so Simon has been given this position within society. And along comes Philip. Now, he's not doing magic tricks. He's sharing the Holy Spirit. Philip really has the message of hope and the future. He might not be able to do magic tricks, and juggle with flames or whatever it was that the magician was doing. But he has hope and a future, and he's... He holds that out to the people of Samaria and they listen to him and they are baptized and even the magician believes because even he wants to know that there's hope and a future and so he is baptized and yet and yet he's not able to fully lay down what he was doing before. He's not able to unlearn his way of life. Maybe it's because that's how he had an income. Jesus found this in the people that he ministered to. He offered them healing and hope and a future, and many of them, too many of them, were not able to lay down the way that they've always lived. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? What do I need to do to inherit the keys to heaven? And Jesus says to him, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the rich young ruler is not able to do that. And as I was reflecting on this yesterday, I realized that I have known and I do know and I'm sure you do as well, folks who have got really excited about Jesus. Maybe this is your experience of people that you've journeyed with, who love the excitement of an event or coming to church or whatever it is. And they've given their lives, apparently, to Jesus. And they've even been baptized. And yet, as time goes on, the life of a Christian is not all about excitement. And they found that they are unable to unlearn their way of life, to lay down how they lived previously. And for Philip, and for me, and I'm sure for some of you, we found that we're still walking with these people, months, perhaps years later, waiting for them to finally be transformed, to finally be the people that God wants them to be. And yet knowing in our hearts, perhaps Philip knows this, that they are reluctant to let go of their worldly security. And so the second part of the story is Peter and John have come all the way from Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit's moving and they meet with Simon. Now, when they meet with him, they are very direct. And they tell him that he needs to recognize his problems. He needs to be honest about where he is. He needs to, to say that he's not able to lay down his worldliness. But he needs to repent. Now, sometimes when we come to church, we say words which are words of repentance. And if we come often enough, this becomes a bit of a pattern. 
Today, our service is a service of communion, and we will have a time of confession during that service. This is a time to repent, and we'll do this by asking the Holy Spirit to call to our minds those times when we've been unable to lay down the things that of the world that we rely on. Repentance means saying sorry and turning away. This is what the magician was asked to do. And, so, and Peter and John... Thank you. This one might not be on YouTube. <laughs> we'll see how much of it is left at the end. We don't know the end of the story. We don't know what happened to the magician. It could be that he com completed his conversion. It might be he went back to doing his magic tricks. We don't know. But Philip remained in Samaria to walk with him. Something else you might have noticed from the very end of that reading. Peter and John went back to Jerusalem, but they went the, the long way round. They went through all the little villages in Samaria so that they could tell the good news. Because it's quite possible that they might have encountered somebody else who needed to hear of that hope and the future that they have in Jesus, which just isn't available anywhere else. So what do we learn through this passage? Well, that persecution has become a tool for mission and ministry, that sometimes the things which we think are the most disastrous, actually God can use. He can move us to other places, to other people who need to hear. Perhaps we've heard that what Jesus wants us to do is not to stay in the same place with lots of other people who think the same as us, but to move to the fringes and tell those that really need to hear. Everyone in the world needs to know that there is hope and a future in Jesus. And perhaps we've heard that we can have faith and courage because of the Holy Spirit in us. Philip wasn't able to do magic tricks. All that Philip took with him was the Holy Spirit in him. Perhaps all that's needed is the Holy Spirit in us. That was the empowering which enabled change to take place. How confident are we that the Spirit in us can work through us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come and persuade us that you are all that we need. Persuade us that you are all that this world needs. we have the greatest message of all time and wherever we find ourselves even far away from where we think of as the center of our christian world there it is that we'll find so many people who need to hear lord give us the courage to speak to witness to the hope and the future that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen.